I want to thank Pastor Chapel for that. Good seeing you this evening. How many are glad you're in church tonight? Amen? Amen. Uh, it's a good crowd here tonight, and I know your pastor would be, his heart is overjoyed that you're here to worship the Lord on Sunday evening service. In our Baptist churches, Sunday evening services are, are the hour of power for our churches, and it's just an opportunity for the pastor just to just unfold his heart and preach to the church and let them know how much he loves them. I'm thankful for this trip that uh, pastor asked me to come to uh, fill the pulpit for me, and I don't take that lightly. Um, I feel that my ministry is an extension of his ministry, and he's the under-shepherd of this church, and of course, Jesus Christ is the great shepherd, and chief shepherd, and bishop of every soul, but as the under-shepherd, I don't take very lightly his, his ministry, and I just see myself as an extension of his ministry this today, and to be a blessing help to his congregation, and as he mentioned, this church has had such an impact on our lives, for my, my life and my wife, Grace. I'm thankful my wife, Grace, could accompany me. Grace, if you want to stand for just a minute to stand up so people can see where you're at. And we've been married for 40 years. We married at the age of five. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> we don't look that we've been married that long, but um, we're thankful for that. We have three adult children, two are married, one is not. We're praying she gets married and soon. And, and we have two precious grandchildren, and uh, I don't know if they spoiled me or I've spoiled them, but it, it's all good, amen, you know? And uh, the little one that's just turned one years old, and she already knows jealousy and envy, and she sees me picking up the five-year-old and loving on her, and she says, eh, I want you to do that to me too, you know? So anyway, you are, th those of your grandparents, you've been there or you're there now, and you understand that, but we, we rejoice in that. I, I think the hardest part for us right now, being away from the church, is I don't know if it's harder being away from the church or being harder away from the grandchildren. So I'm, I'm not going to tell the church that, but it's all good, amen? You know, praise the Lord for that. Well, this evening, why don't you stand with me to turn to Acts chapter 26 this evening. Acts chapter 26. I apologize for those of you, the 11 o'clock service. I, I knew something was wrong with the sound, but Larry came over and he was pointing at me and I thought maybe I had it on mute. And I told the, the, one of the sound men this morning, I said, you know, whenever I go out, somehow there's, there's something about uh, PA systems and they, me, I just, something doesn't go right. I don't know if they're demonized when I get to the pulpit or whatever there, you know. But uh, I didn't realize my mic, my mic had fallen off and was dragging there and they had turned this on. I knew it was kind of louder, so I didn't realize that I'd walked off, that it slipped off there. So hopefully it doesn't slip off tonight. And if it does, you guys just wave at me, throw a paper airplane at me, throw rocks at me, whatever it might do, you know, do something to get my attention, let me know so I don't mess people up tonight. Acts chapter 26, go with me to verse 13. I appreciate your theme, the pastor has chosen. I don't think it get any more basic and yet any more essential than trusting God, amen? amen? I mean, if you're not trusting God, what are you trusting? Who are you trusting? If you read Psalms 118, it tells us it is better to trust in the Lord than trust in a man. Amen. And every time the Bible says something's better, I think we need to zone in on that word better, amen? amen. You need to trust God. And here's a ministry at Lancaster Baptist Church that's been here for many years. You never stop trusting God. You never stop exercising faith. In fact, the mysterious thing about faith is that, as we sang about today, faith is a victory. You just realize you don't have enough faith. And the greatest thing, Jesus had to mature and grow his disciples. And he said, oh, ye of little faith. The Bible tells us without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, and that's what we do when we pray. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And a reward of them that diligently seek him. Notice in Acts chapter 26, verse 13, Paul had a divinely arranged appointment with King Agrippa. I, I just love it when God arranges appointments for us. Amen? Amen. Yep. And as he does so, all we can do is trust him. You study this, you, those of you Bible students, Paul didn't have time to put together a message. It was already burning inside of him. And he's, sitting, he's standing there before this king. And he has an audience with people that the Lord told him about in Acts chapter 9. I'll have you before kings. And all Paul wanted to do is get to Rome to talk to Caesar and tell him, listen, what the Jews are, telling you, are saying is wrong. They've thrown me under the bus. He said, I'm just preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he gets this privilege to speak to King Agrippa, and there's a, there's, a, there's, a lot of recur there's a lot of important themes he gives here, but there's one I want you to see as we read from here down to verse 22. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, 
above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, or as our Hispanic brethren would say, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He's just basically, the Lord's saying, you know what? Don't fight with God. Amen? Amen. And if you're fighting with God, don't kick against the pricks tonight. Amen? Amen. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I'll appear unto thee. I love that thought about witnessing, amen? amen. The things which thou hast seen, and the things which I'm going to show you later. That's why the Christian life is an abundant life, amen? amen. It's a joy to serve Jesus. Amen. It's a joy to give out a gospel tract. It's wonderful to tell people how to get saved. Amen? Amen. And he said in verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Now, if you want to capsulize his mission, it's right there in verse 18. Did he delay? Did he wait? Did he ask 15 different guys for their counsel? No, look at verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. And he's doing the work of God. He's having a great time serving the Lord. It's, it's wonderful to serve God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Then he said in verse 21, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. What would you do? You're just trying to serve God. Discouraging event comes. Someone's trying to keep him from serving the Lord. In his case, they catch him of all places in the temple where there should be respect of God and respect for God's man. And they catch him in the temple, and as you read this previous passage there in the previous chapters, there's two sides holding on to him. And he felt like he was going to be pulled apart. They had death in their eyes. Forty men pledged their lives. We're not going to eat and drink till we kill this man. He knew it. He said in there, this verse, for these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Then he said in verse 22, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did, did say should come. Paul said, Having therefore obtained help of God. Everybody in this room needs God's help. Amen. And if you're not at the place this evening where you think you don't need God's help, you will be. And I want to tell you some things tonight about the help of God and trusting the Lord that we need. Because Apostle Paul is with him on all the things we articulate about how great he was. In great humility, he said, having obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. Our Lord, we thank you tonight for the music that has been sung, our hearts being stirred, an incredible day of worship this morning. We thank you. It's about you, about your son. It's about giving you the glory and the praise and the honor. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, whose name is above every name. And tonight, Lord, we bow before the name of Christ in heart, our thoughts, words, and deed in mind. We pray for Pastor Chapel. God, undergird him. 
Give him a double portion of the Spirit this week. We pray that God you give him wisdom beyond his experience as he's dealing with many, many things. Give him sharpness. Give him quickness. Give him sustainability. Give him endurance. Lord, give him great love. And I know already that he loves Asia and all that God that you want to do in Asia. And use Pastor Chapel and all those who assembled there to be your conduit, your channels, to dispense the grace of God through gospel preaching, church planting, and the work of the Lord. We pray for great results and great things that we'll hear over the next few days. I pray tonight that you continue working the hearts of the dear precious members of the Lancaster Baptist Church and giving sacrificially and making those pledges for Kid City and thinking about, Lord, the great investment that's being made for the lives of children, that what we're investing now will manifest itself in the next 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. Eternal investment in lives. And thinking about how many more children can be reached in the Antelope Valley. How many more kids can be brought in. How many more families will be reached. And Lord, that stirs us and excites us. I pray this evening, Lord, that you'd help me. I pray for your power for my weakness. Your ability for my inability. I pray to God, Lord, for your sufficiency, for my insufficiency. I pray right now that I will decrease and Christ will increase. I ask this evening that you help me to be a blessing and help in pastors, in pastors, uh, for pastor, in, in pastor's place tonight as I preach your eternal, timeless word to the precious people of Lancaster Baptist Church. Help me, Lord, tonight to feed the flock of God which is among us. Lord, help me to take the oversight thereof this evening as we preach, as I give the word of God. May you cleanse us this evening from your word, as even as was sung just a moment ago. May you sanctify us through your word. May you light a fire in us through your word. We, they, we pray that the commandments of the Lord would make wise the simple. We ask tonight that the word of the Lord, would, because it's perfect, it would convert the soul. We ask tonight, that Lord, that you'd help us as the servants of God to respond, to be moved, to be energized. And Lord, if anything else, to learn to trust you even more than we've ever had before. Please help me tonight, Lord. Please help our congregation. We ask these things now, Lord, of you in the precious name of, your save, of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Help. Very simple word. A single syllable word. Help. A distress call. The call of someone has no resources or capability. The call of someone who's trapped and in need of immediate resource, immediate rescue. It's the call of a ship or aircraft in disaster. It's the call of victims of a natural disaster, such as a massive earthquake, a tsunami, hurricane, or flooding. Certainly everybody in this room can remember a time as a child or as an adult you cried out that simple word, help. And you were thankful like I have been many times when help came, when help was on the way, when help was there, when we needed the most. Paul makes an encouraging statement in verse 22, having therefore obtained help of God. I wanna encourage you about some things about the help, about the word help tonight, the help of God. The word help is found 166 times in our English King James Version Bible. The word sucker or sucker, depending on how you want to pronounce it, which also means help, is found six times. We think of the name Ebenezer from 1 Samuel 7, 2, which means God helps us. We think of the name Eliezer, which, mean, in which we find in 2 Samuel 23, 9, which means God, my help. In the Hebrew, that word azir just basically means help. And Paul speaks about help, not from a human standpoint, but help of God. He's speaking about help that God gave him. He's speaking about specific times, repeated times, recurring times that God had given him help. He's appearing now before King Herod Agrippa, giving a fabulous testimony, and as he capsulizes everything that God is doing in his life with the intention and hope that he would clear the air about all the false charges and innuendos that were made about him, he says this, I obtain help of God. I was stoned. I was hurt. They wanted to kill me, but I've obtained help of God. Would you notice three things about Paul's life and things that led to him making the statement in verse 22? The first thing you'll notice with me in verses 9 to 11, would you notice Paul's endeavor? Paul's endeavor. As we read this passage, we cannot help but understand, remind ourselves, 
Paul is testifying of things that happened years before. Paul is speaking about a man who is on a mission. Paul was a man on a mission. Paul was a man that was lit on fire. Paul was a man that had a directive from God. And I, one thing I appreciate about the ministry, and I appreciate about Pastor Chapel and the men of God here on the staff, and I appreciate about pastors that assemble here for things like spiritual leadership conference or come here for that preach chapel for West Coast Baptist College. I appreciate and I just try to study out as much as I can men who have a calling, a mission of God. They know what their mission is. They know what their calling is. Nothing's going to sidetrack them. There's no wind that's going to blow them off track. They know their mission. They know what they're called to do and they're intent on doing it. Paul was on a mission. Notice as we consider Paul's endeavor, we have to kind of see how all of this unfolds. Notice in verses 9 to 11, 9 to 12, we see Paul's malicious career. Here Paul starts off, our first introduction to Paul is as a persecutor of the Christian faith. A persecutor there. Our first introduction to him, there is in Acts chapter 7, when the Jews got angry angry and upset, this mob infuriated, this infuriated mob of Jews who got upset with the preaching of Stephen, and they took up stones, they dragged him out the city, and they stoned him. As they took, dragged Stephen out, they took their cloaks off, and they laid at the feet of this young man by the name of Saul. And I don't know, you know, we don't know much about, it, about, about Saul at that moment. We do know about his background. Philippians 3 tells us about him being, his training, his background, and all that. But, you know, you don't know what, you know, Paul was just probably just a bystander there, just a young man watching what's going on. But something about that moment, something about the fury of that moment and the anger and the hatred and the hostility that these Jews had against Stephen, the Christian faith, kind of lit a fire into him. And Paul, from that moment on, decided, I have found my mission. I'm going after Christians. I'm going to, I'm going to get them incarcerated. I'm going to get letters as much as I can and go after them. Look at some things he said. He said in verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I, he said in verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, many of the saints that I shut up in prison have received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Notice verse 11, I punished them often in every synagogue. I compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. Can you imagine that? Being exceedingly mad against them. Paul's endeavor, as far as he was concerned, he was going to spend the rest of his life going after the Christian faith. You imagine if Paul was alive now, he'd, be, he'd set his targets on Lancaster Baptist Church. He set his targets on Heritage Baptist Church. He set his targets on churches like ours. His, his, his just bottom line with him was that he was a man driven in his endeavor to persecute, to hurt, to maim, to kill, whatever he could. He had a malicious career, but I'm thankful it doesn't stop with his malicious career. I'm thankful he had a miraculous conversion, amen? amen. Aren't you glad that God can save anybody? Aren't you glad God wants to save everybody? Aren't you glad tonight there is no sinner too hard for Jesus that he cannot save? I'm going to remind you tonight, maybe some of you are like members of my church. You've been praying for years for a loved one to get saved. Maybe, ma'am, you're praying for your husband who's been unsaved to get saved. Maybe, sir, you're praying for your unsaved wife to get saved. Maybe you're praying for some child that's grown up in church, but they just never, their heart has been hardened to the gospel message. I want to encourage you to never give up on praying and don't give up on them getting saved. Listen, Jesus is in the business of saving. Amen. He saves to the uttermost and to the gutter. Amen. We thank God that he saves there. And so Paul talks now later on about the, the Bible talks about his miraculous conversion. And Paul never could get over that he got saved. He couldn't get over about the fact as he was making his way to Damascus with letters in his hand that he got knocked off his horse and he saw a light shining from heaven. Aren't you glad that Jesus Christ is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings? Right. He's the light of the world. He shines brightly. Aren't you glad that, that Paul, as he's riding on his mighty horse, thinking he's going to get his job done, God knocks him off this horse. Don't you know this evening that sometimes we can get high and mighty and a little bit haughty and a little bit proud, and we can think we're hot stuff, and every now and then God has to just knock us off our horse. Amen? Right. Remind you, when a fall off a horse, it's a hard fall. It's a difficult fall. Whatever they show you on those westerns there about somebody getting, if not getting knocked off his horse, getting back up and brush himself off if it didn't hurt, that's Hollywood. That's not real life. Amen? Right. He speaks about his glorious conversion. I remember back in 1971, the nine previous years, my parents had put me into a Catholic school. And I did what you're supposed to do in parochial school. And then went on to become the leading student, number one, in catechism. By eighth grade, I knew catechism like the back of my hand. Never was baptized Catholic, but for all practical purposes, my thinking, my speech, everything, I was Catholic. 
They let me be an altar boy at third grade. I mean, whatever it was. I wanted to go on to Catholic high school. Our school I went to only went to eighth grade. I played basketball with all my friends. I loved basketball. I wanted to just go to Catholic high school because I wanted to be with my friends and play basketball. My dad said, no, son, we're moving to a different part of Oakland. And he said, uh, you're going to go to public school. I thought public school scared me because I said, well, I'm going from a small school to a big school. I didn't know anything about that. And my first day in public school, I went there and, I, you know, I didn't know anybody there. I wasn't scared about it, but I didn't know anybody there. And I sat down at a table, a bunch of kids. I thought they were about the same age as me. Some kids said, hey, Alan. I said, how does he know my name? This guy by the name of Bill, and he called me over. He said, what are you doing to sit with the seventh grader? You're ninth grader. Come sit with the ninth grader. I said, yeah, that's not cool. I'm, not, I'm sitting with seventh graders here, you know? This guy, Bill, I found out just two weeks later, maybe less than two weeks later, that he'd been going to Methodist church since he was a kid. And he said, I'm going to tell you something great. I got saved. I said, what does that mean? 14-year-old boy said, got excited about the Lord. He said, I got saved. And he gave me, for the very first time in my life, a gospel track. Church name was on it. Bible verses on the inside. Pastor's picture on the inside. And I looked at the gospel track. I didn't understand a thing about it. But I will tell you this, I didn't throw it away. And I looked at that gospel track, and I just kind of had it there on my dresser in my family home. And I'd look at it every now and then. I said, man, i got to learn about this. And my friend Bill, every single week for the next several weeks, Dr. R, without a beat, he'd call me on Saturday night. Hey, would you like to come to church? My rider is going to pick me up down on 35th Avenue, and we're, we have to pass where you live on Rhoda Avenue on the way. We'll come pick you up and bring you to church. And every week I said, let me check my dad, because we had a family business, and uh, you know everybody did their part in the family business there, and I, and I couldn't do it. And then finally, finally about Thanksgiving time, my dad said, hey, you know what? Um, your friend's been inviting you. We, we can do it. We'll be okay this Sunday. Do you want to go to church with your friend, your, you know, your friend Bill? And my dad wasn't saved. And I said, well, sure, I think Bill would like that. I'd like it. I'd like to check his church out. And, you know, of course, I went with a different kind of motive and idea there. And I went to the church and service started, preacher got preaching. I remember the preacher preached from Daniel chapter 3 about, uh, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Of course, when I preach about I like to use their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I don't like to use those Babylonian names. Those are heathen names they met, you know, if you know what I mean there, you know. But uh, I remember he preached on that. And then he gave that gospel invitation that we always give in our Baptist service. Aren't you glad for the invitation? Amen. Amen. And you've heard the stories to pet somebody telling you, you know, you held on to the chair in front of you and your, 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 your knuckles turned white. That was me. And then I started thinking, no wonder Bill put us on the front row. No wonder he wanted me to shake the pastor's hand. He says, don't you want to go up? And, I, and I'm thinking back, my, no, I want to get out of here right now as fast as I can. I was finding the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He knows the Holy Spirit. I determined that week, I'm not coming back. Whatever that feeling was, in my mind I was thinking, whatever that feeling was, I don't want it again. It was very uncomfortable. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit makes you uncomfortable, amen, you know? Amen. And, you know, Dr. R, I rehearsed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, what I'm going to tell Bill. And like clockwork, at 7.30, he called me Saturday night, hey, we're coming by, we're going to drive through your way, can we pick you and bring you to church? No, Bill. Why? Got to help Dad. My dad's sitting down there. He said, you don't need to help me. Boy, I got enough help here. Shh. Shh. And that was when we had the old rotary phones. How many remember that? Amen? Amen. You're not saved. You don't remember the rotary phones. Amen? You know? <laughs> he tried to convince me for 15 minutes to come to church. I was very adamant. No. I hung up the phone, a split-level house. Our, our, family, our family area was downstairs. All the living areas were upstairs. The family area led to our backyard, things like that. I had just put the phone, hung it up. Five minutes didn't go by. The doorbell rings. Now, I live in Oakland. If you weren't here this morning, I said, I'm from the part of our country that's called the land of the quick and the dead. If you're not quick, you're going to be dead. It's also the area that I call the People's Republic of California. Amen? Amen. If you don't understand that, come see me after service. I'll explain that to you there. <laughs> Dad said, go open the door. He goes, who is it? Okay. The ninth grade Sunday school teacher, the boy's Sunday school teacher, was at the door. 
Saturday night, 7.45. Do you remember me? I see, I remember you. We had Sunday school in a, I think it was a 10 passenger van or 15 passenger, I remember it was, it was a van we were in. Can I come in? I said, sure. We sat on the couch. And I probably was the most argumentative, stiff neck. And now even though you got a hardened 14 year old, I was pretty hard then. I argued with him. I threw questions at him. I threw everything I could think of that came from catechism. And thank God he answered every question from the Bible, God's word. Amen. It has now gone from eight o'clock. It's almost 1030 at night. My mom and dad are crossing the room. What is going on in this room? What are you guys talking about? <clears throat> and the Sunday school teacher said, Alan, let's stop for a minute. I've answered every question you've asked me from God's word. Have I not? I said, yeah, you yeah. have. He said, but you haven't answered my question. Well, by then, Dr. I had forgotten what the question was. Brother first, so you know the question is, if you die today, would you, are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? That time he asked it, it's kind of like the word of God, like it says, it was a sharp twitch of sword that pierced me. He said, are you going to heaven or going to hell? He said, don't give me your answer based on what you think. Give me the answer based on what I told you from the Bible. And I said, if the Bible's true, and by the way, it is true. Amen. I'm going to hell. He says, that's what you want to do? I dropped my head. I said, no. Why don't you get saved tonight? And I'm thankful that night, December 4th, 1971, I got saved. And I don't treat it lightly. It wasn't under the salvation like the Apostle Paul. But I want to tell you, every conversion is a miraculous conversion. My conversion, your conversion. A child's conversion, someone on their deathbed's conversion. Paul had a miraculous conversion. But we see something else. Paul's in his endeavor. He, we, see his, we see his malicious career. We see his missionary, we see his, uh, we see his miraculous conversion. But now we go a little bit further down. In the remainder of this passage, he deals with his missionary calling. He says, who art thou, Lord? And what wilt thou have me to do? And here as we read these verses, Paul is given his commission by God. Paul is sent from God. God says, listen, I want you to stand upon your feet in verse 16. I says, I've made you both a minister and a witness of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear to thee. He said, I'm, I've given you some things right now that you've seen. There are more things I'm going to show you. I want you to be a witness of these things. He says, I'm going to, he says, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to deliver you from the people, from these Jews. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. You're going to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Gentiles. He said, I'm sending you. Paul, God was getting his sending orders from Paul. And that's what we're praying for in Spiritual Leadership Conference Asia, that some men will get their sending orders from God and go to some of these countries that need the gospel. And thank God for some of these countries. I think about many of the Filipino brethren who have the ability of getting into countries without visa issues that many of us in the Western countries cannot get into. They're just very resilient. They have this ability of getting in there. They can learn the language very quickly. And uh, Paul right here, he's just he's saying, God just sent me there. And he told me in verse 18, here's what I'm supposed to do. My mission is to open their eyes to the word of God and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul just said, listen, God turned all that energy that was in me, all that energy I had about persecuting Christians, he's transformed that energy into energy and intention and a mission and emotion of going after people and telling them about Jesus Christ. In fact, if anything, going to the Gentiles, going to the pagan nations, going to the Romans, going to the, to the Grecians, going to those who are pagan, who worship idols, and bringing the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. He's sending me out to be a pioneer in preaching the word of God. Listen, Paul didn't understand maybe all of what was going on, but Paul knew one thing. I will not be disobedient to the heavenly vision. And he took off, and he started blazing the trail, and started telling people about Jesus Christ. And we owe today churches like Lancaster Baptist Church, and churches like Heritage Baptist Church, long before we got started. All of that got started because of the missionary calling that was in the Apostle Paul. Listen, we don't get things done unless we move. We understand what our endeavor is and we move with a sense of mission and a sense of urgency and a sense that we've got a calling from God and God wants us to do something great for him. You read this a little bit further, Paul's very clear about his purpose. Look at it, verse 16, he tells us about his purpose. He tells us about the people he sent to. 
He tells about the priority in ascending. Paul had a heavenly endeavor. Paul knew that God had called him to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Listen, Paul, we see Paul's endeavor. But notice we get down to verse 21. And we see Paul endangered. He said in verse 21, for these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple, went about to kill me. The very outset, Paul's life was in constant danger. He's in Damascus. He gets with the disciples. He gets into a discipleship program there. He sees their fervency, their boldness. Next thing you read, the Bible says, after receiving me, Paul is strengthened. He goes out there and starts preaching Jesus. At first, they laughed it off. Then they thought, this guy's pretty serious. He means business. He's got a fervency for Jesus. And now those Jews have turned against him. And we read later on in 2 Corinthians 11, he describes a little bit further how the, the, the governor there of Damascus there, he basically, he said, okay, surround the city, close off the gates. He says, I want to send some men. We're going to kill this guy. And Paul's life is constantly endangered. They let him down. Remember that story? They let him down in a basket by the wall. And later on, we find Paul, as he's going on his journey, we find Paul not just there. We read later on in Antioch, Pisidia, the Jews raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas. And then later on, he goes from there to Iconium. And the Bible says an assault was made both of the Gentiles and Jews against him. And then he goes from there to Lystra and Derby. And there, the Bible says that they initially, they received him well. But there at Lystra and Derby, the Jews caught him, took him outside the city, and they picked up stones and they stoned him. He had received his first stoning experience. He received, first of all, his first major persecution. I'm talking about where physical assault was made on him. They manhandled him. They beat him. They pummeled him. They stoned him hard enough. They thought they had killed the apostle Paul. And yet Paul gets back up and he goes on. At Philippi, he and Silas are beaten and they're scourged. And we have the first recording of Paul getting scourged there. He's scourged. He's embarrassed. He's placed in stocks. And there he's in prison. At Thessalonica, he had a short-lived campaign there because after three Sabbath days of preaching, they raised up a, a, a bunch of people that were, went against him and they had to take Paul, Paul out of Thessalonica. He goes to Berea and he finds some brethren who are searching the scriptures and he goes through the same experience and then from there he goes down to Athens he's all there by himself and the Bible says there at Athens seeing the the city holy given idolatry was serving himself he said I can't wait for my friends to come I've got to get up and preach the gospel and he received hostile treatment he had to step by to the hostile treatment people got saved and now we find him down at Corinth he's down at Corinth there and after preaching campaign a church getting started the Jews there's a there's an insurrection against Paul there and then later on he goes to Ephesus there's an insurrection there I mean you trace the 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 the, the endeavor and the travels and the, the mission of the Apostle Paul. I mean, here's a man who's constantly endangered. Notice verse 21, he says, for these causes, for preaching the gospel, for planting churches, telling people the love of God, telling people the church is here to help you, he says, the Jews caught me in the temple and were out to kill me. I'm going to tell you tonight, you stay at preaching the gospel, serving the Lord, wanting areas to be one for Jesus Christ, it's going to cost you. One of my staff members was doing some street preaching, went to one of our BART stations, he's preaching there. As he's preaching, Folks around him, some of our men around him, giving gospel tracts out. A crime was happening. He tried to avert the crime. He got assaulted. Didn't get hurt. He could have retaliated back. He can defend himself. He didn't. But he got assaulted. I think of, I think of a preacher that I met just a month ago who started a church in Virginia about two years ago. Roughest part of that city. He said, he opened his testimony by saying, in my city, you hear gunshots all the time. You just know it's a gunshot. And he said that, well, the church was out so many one Saturday, a couple of men came running back to him. He was still back at church, getting people mobilized. They said, hey, just want to let you know, pastor, 
your son was shot at there at this project just two blocks down from the street. This pastor who had been several tours of duty, was thinking in his mind, he says, you know, I, I did things to people that I don't want to do again. That crossed his mind. He said, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to think those things. But he was concerned about his son. He went down there concerned about his son because his son has been shot at. And from what we understand from the story, that the bullet just basically grazed past his head. It didn't hit him, but it grazed past his head. He went looking for his son, calling out for his son. He's a 16-year-old boy. And his son said, hey, Dad, I'm over here. I'm knocking on doors. His son kept on going so on. I'm going to tell you, it's going to cost you if you want to serve Jesus Christ. We've had bus ministry here. There have been gang fights on the buses. There have been people who probably shot at here. I know of pastors where their bus ministries, they've been shot at there. It's going to cost you. And then I think about this. You go to 2 Corinthians 11, if you want to turn there for just a minute. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about the things he went through. He talked about the circumstances, situations. He was constantly in danger. And I think about what he says here in 2 Corinthians 11. He said in verse, verse 23, he said, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor is more abundant. In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent. Then he said this, in deaths often. Is that your testimony? I mean, Paul, Paul was in danger. Paul was in this place where the average Christian who would have persecution or pushback or rejection, we might step back a little bit and say, you know what, maybe I need to cool it a little bit. Maybe I need to be a little, a little bit more risk averse. Maybe I need to cut it down. Maybe, I, maybe instead of going down to the projects there in those difficult areas, maybe instead of what I need to do, I need to go to the more upper income areas there because it's a little bit safer there. I mean, do we take the risk averse approach or do we realize every sinner needs the gospel of Jesus Christ? And you read Apostle Paul here, he mentions maybe six, seven times in verse 26 about the word perils. And remind you this evening, brother and sister in Christ, for all of us, all that will live godly will suffer persecution. If we are in the day and age right now that we're in of anarchy and apathy and apostasy, Things can get more difficult, and they are, then they they'll be getting easier for us. The Apostle Paul, who had scars all over him, I imagine if he took off his cloak and bore his back to people, we'd see the many stripes that he bore. I think we'd see the scars on his ankles and his wrists. I think we would probably see the scars from the stoning that he received. I think we'd be reminded of the, the horrendous stories of being out in the deep and in the ocean on different nights, on the shipwrecks that he had. And in spite of all those things, it did not deter him. It did not discourage him. It did not stop him. Oh, I'm certain there were times he may have been discouraged. It's not recording scripture. I'm certain there were times, maybe the devil put in his mind, Paul, maybe you better find a different career. I, may, I think there may have been times the devil may be put in his mind momentarily. Hey, you know what? God's left you. God's not there for you. But Paul was in danger and he didn't let that deter him. Paul knew he was in danger. Now watch this tonight. We see Paul's endeavors. We see Paul in danger. But here's the best part. Here's the part I want to get at. I want you to notice verse 22. We see Paul enabled. We see Paul enabled. Yes, he had the shipwrecks, and yes, he had the scourgings, and yes, he had the stonings, and yes, he had the rejection, and yes, he had more enemies than he had friends. Perhaps you could look at it from that way. And yes, he had people that wanted to pull him apart, and yes, he had people that hated him. And you know what? Hatred is a horrible thing. It's a horrible feeling to know that you're hated. It's a horrible thing to know that you're rejected. It's a horrible thing to know that that's going on. But Paul said this, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day. Paul knew that greater than him was the fact that he had a God who loved him and a God who was there. He had the help of God in getting him safely out of Damascus. He had the help of God in Lystra. I mean, can you imagine there in Lystra as he's pummeled, as he's stoned, as he's lying there and those new converts are just around him. Here's Barnabas, his partner right there. And then, then you look at maybe Timothy and, and, and his, his grandmother and his mother, Lois and Eunice around him and whoever those other believers are, that fledgling group of believers all around him. And here's Paul lying there perhaps in a pool of blood, maybe some broken bones, possibly a concussion from having been stoned and the Jews having left him there for dead. And you can imagine some, come on, Paul, get up. Come on, Paul, get up. Come on, Paul, you can do it. Come on, Paul, we need to get you up. And the Bible says, Paul didn't whimper there. Paul didn't cry there. Paul didn't give his resignation. No, Paul recognized in his heart of hearts and mind of mind that God was giving him help. And he rose up, the Bible says, and he went right back into Lystra. He went back and faced his persecutor. He went back and told him, listen, you may have hurt me, but I still love you. I want you to know there's a God who still loves you. He said, I've obtained help of God. He got God's help at Damascus. He got God's help 
up at Lystra. He got God's help in Philippi. There at Philippi, after he's been shamed, after he's been embarrassed, after he's been scourged, after he's been stoned, there at midnight, the Bible says, he and Silas start to sing. Listen, if you go to jail for Jesus, just remember this, just sing. Amen. And I'm not talking about sing, sing, amen, you know. They sang praises to God. And wouldn't you know, who would have thought singing would bring a major earthquake, amen? amen. Yeah. And open the prison doors. He got to lead the Philippian jailer and his whole family to Christ. Baptized him that night, that's great. We didn't finish there. He got God's help at Thessalonica. He got God's help at Berea. He got God's help at Athens. He got God's help in Ephesus. He got God's help at Corinth. He got God's help everywhere he went. I want to tell you, help of God is on the way. Help of God is when we need it the most. God's help is there, having obtained help of God. Let me tell you some things about the help of God. Would you notice this first off? You turn over to Psalms 121. First of all, the help of God is sufficient. The psalmist said in Psalms 121, verse 1 and 2, I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. How many thankful you can look to the hills and find your help? Amen. Amen. The help of God is sufficient for us. It's exactly what we need, when we need it, where we need it. In fact, look what the psalmist said later on in Psalms 124. I love these psalms of ascent here. They're so wonderful. In Psalms 124, he said, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, then their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over us. Then you go down to verse 8, and he says this, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The help of God is sufficient for us. It is his sufficiency for our insufficiency. It is his strength for our weakness. It is his capability for our incapability. It is power for my powerlessness. The help of God is sufficient. But notice, the help of God sustains us. Paul said this, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue this day. You know, Paul liked using that word continue. He told Timothy later on in 2 Timothy 3.14, as he was getting ready to face the executioner's acts, where his head would be severed from his body. He said, Timothy, I just want to give you this word. Continue thou in the things which thou hast heard and thou hast learned from me. He, he loved that word continue. But undergirding that word continues, the fact the apostle Paul said, having obtained help of God, I continue to say, listen, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have days and times, those fiery darts of Satan are going to fire at you and he's going to try to discourage you. He's going to try to move you some way. He's going to try to distract you. And we've got to depend on God's help. We've got to realize we need God's help day in and day out. We've got to realize we need God's help when the things are going good and when things are going bad. When we don't have the offerings, and when we do have the offering. When the auditorium's full, when the auditorium's not full. We have to realize we need God's help when somebody might turn against us and when we're rejected. We just have to understand this. We can have God's help. God's help is sufficient, but God's help sustains us. It's His help that keeps us in fellowship with Him. It's His help that keeps us on our knees. It's His help that keeps us faithful to Him. It's His help that helps us stay faithful to God. It's His help that enabled you last week to give that wonderful offering that you did for Kids City. It's His help that's going to help you next year for the next offering. It's His help that's going to help you to have an outstanding over-the-top Easter Sunday on April 9th. It's His help. It's His help that helps you to go on and face the trials and difficulties of the day. It's His help that's going to help you as the state of California might be going through some difficult times. It's your, His help that reminds us that in spite of the difficult times, God's help is there to continue to say, I'm thankful Heritage Baptist Church and Lancaster Baptist Church, we can stay in and stay out. We can keep on going because you know what? We have help of God and we continue to this day. You need his help to be steadfast. You need his help to be clean. You need his help to be pure. You need his help to be faithful. You need his help to take that extra step of faith. His help sustains us. The help of God is something else. And only sufficient and only sustains us. The help of God is supernatural. Remember the story about 
In 2 2 Samuel 23 about Eliezer, David, the Philistines came down. They attacked most likely a barley field. The enemy knows if I go after your food source, I'm going to disable you. So they wanted to go after their barley field. And it says David was there with his men, but it says all of Israel fled. And there was only one man that stayed with David during that whole time. It was a man by the name of Eliezer. And the focus is on Eliezer because he said, I'm not going to leave, I'm not going to abandon my king. I'm not going to leave my king standing here by himself. I'm going to fight this battle. And he said, by the way, I'm not going to abandon my king. I'm not going to abandon the field. I remind you tonight, you've been here many years. You've been new. Don't abandon the church. Stay strong in the church. Don't abandon your pastor. Don't abandon the church this time. Stay by your pastor. Stay by the church. Stay by the college. Stay by the missionaries that you support. Stay by everything you do here at Lancaster Baptist Church. Why? Because your king needs your help. And so they stayed there and they defended the field. And the Bible says something interesting about this man, Eliezer. The Bible says that his hand held tightly to the sword. Remember that? His hand held tightly to the sword. And as I thought about that, I thought about the fact, if you ever held tightly to something, there comes a time when your hand starts to shake and you want to let go. And the Bible says his hand claved to the sword. If you know anything about the word cleave, it basically means to be, uh, to be glued to, to adhere to, or to be, as we would say, when the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, that a man and and his wife should be cleaved together. It means they're to become one. Listen, Eliezer, he'd been fighting that battle for so long on defending that field because he was intent that field was not going to be taken. His hand became one with the sword. That's what God wants for you and I. That's why he wants you in church to become one with the sword, the sword, the word of the Lord. Amen. He wants to be one with his word and one with what he's doing. And the supernatural strength of God enabled him to hold on to the sword. He could have dropped the sword. He could have said, I'm going to quit. It's too hard. It's too weary. His hand claimed to the sword. And it isn't interesting the Bible says, the Lord that day wrought a great victory. Now, the name Eliezer, as I said earlier in the message, means my help is of God. Your help is of God. Amen. You're going to be called upon, I'm going to be called upon to do some extraordinary things, to stand for God. It may be, you may be lonely, you may be all by yourself, but listen, as God calls upon us to do those things, I remind you today, we have the help of God. The help of God sustains us. The help of God is supernatural. I remind you today, we have the help of God. A pastor friend of mine in another state had one of his members call me. Grace, when was that? Was that September for Adele? Was that September, October? For... This member called me from the church. He said, hey, my pastor asked me to call you. He said, my father has a business partner. And we just found out that he's taking a turn for the worse. He's dying for cancer. And he's in your area. So where does he live? He told me the city. He's a 15-minute drive from here. In fact, Dr. R., it's where you and I go for steak every time you come to preach for us. just around the corner from there. Texas Roadhouse, okay? I said, I'll go. I said, can you call his wife? Tell her who I am. I said, I'm not going to drop in unannounced. They need to know who I am. Otherwise, if I come in abruptly, it may not be a good visit. Let them know I'm coming. If they don't want to receive me, that's fine, but let them know I'm coming. I prayed that morning. It was Tuesday morning. I went to that house, and I didn't realize the man was already in hospice. In a hospice bed right in his living room. The wife was not there when I got there. The daughter opened the door. The adult daughter said, oh, Mom didn't tell me about you, but if you're a pastor, come on in. Dr. I was probably from here to where you're at, where his bed was at. I knew this man didn't have long. His brother sent across him with a very somber, stoic face. But first, you ever had those visits where you go in and just... You, you sense the devil's really fighting that meeting. You know what I'm talking about? You just have those visits, the devil's fighting you. And there was a lot of resistance from the family that was there because the wife had not come in at that moment. She'd run some errands. I've done many visits like this, but on that particular day, I felt extremely awkward, small, foolish, 
and honestly a failure. His wife finally came in about 10 minutes later. She said, Pastor, I'm sorry. I ran some errands. I forgot you're coming. I said, Adela, come over here. I went to his right side. I said, is he right hand or left hand? She said, right hand. I said, I'm going to go on his right side. You go on his left side. I said, have you had any motion from him? She said, none. I said, um, any responsiveness at all? She says, none. And we tried for half an hour. We talked to him, I mean, whatever. She tried to get him to open his eyes. And I said, Adela, let's try this. Um, let me call you tonight. He's not responsive right now. It's about 1.30 in the afternoon. Let me call you tonight. She said, okay, Pastor. I said, will everybody be gone or still you have a lot of family? She said, well, we got family coming in, but 7 o'clock's a good time. Call me. They won't be here. I said, good. I called her up at 7. I had a prayer group that night at 8 with some of my men. I said, I'm going I'm to talk to you for the next hour here. I told her why I came. And I sat there on the phone as I talked to her. I said, I'm going to tell her how to get saved. I started telling about the Lord Jesus Christ, about the love of God, and how Jesus can save anybody. Amen? Amen. And unlike that afternoon, on that phone call, I was saying under my breath, I said, God, I need your help. I need your help. This lady needs to get saved. Her husband needs to get saved. 45 minutes later, Adela said, Pastor, I need what you're talking about. I want to get saved right now. A letter to Christ on the phone. After she got saved, I said, Adela, everything I just walked you through, that's what I'm trying to get your husband to understand. I said, I don't want to sound morbid. I don't want to sound like I'm out of my place, but your husband doesn't have a lot of time. I don't think he's got days. So we've got to find a way with God's help to get him saved. I said, now I need to get there tomorrow. What's the best time to come? You tell me the time. You want me there at 5 o'clock in the morning? I'll get there at 5 o'clock in the morning. She said, come at 8 a.m. in the morning. I got there right at 8 o'clock. Unlike the day before when I walked in, just a sense of just resistance. So one of those days I just walked in, I sensed the liberty of the Holy Spirit when I walked in that room. She said, Pastor, I said, how did you do last night? She said, well, he was a little more responsive. Give him some apple juice. Sometimes he opened his eyes, which he wasn't doing before. He would make a grunt here and there. I said, Adela, you're going to help me to get your husband to respond, to understand he needs to get saved today. And I don't know what time it took. About 10 minutes after that, we started getting responses out of him. Amen. Sometimes a squeezing of a hand. Sometimes a opening of his eyes. But this man, Charles, 40, 45 minutes later, trusted Jesus Christ as personal Amen. Savior. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, it, was, it looked like in a very impossible situation, humanly speaking. She said, Pastor, don't leave yet. She said, my daughter is going to come in in a few minutes. She went around the corner and bought this really good bread. Now, bread and coffee, me, that's a, that's a dangerous chemistry because I, I just sit there and drink and eat and, you know, drink, eat, drink and be merry, right, you know? She said, have some coffee, some bread. I said, I really shouldn't. She said, please, please. So we sat down, talked a little bit, and I thought, I'm going to use this opportunity to build some bridges with her, her daughter, so I can come back and talk to her daughter about the Lord. We talked for another half hour, and I said, you know, I really need to get going. And I said, before we do, can we just get with Charles one more time? She said, yeah. And unlike the day before, because I told her, I said, you know, there's, there's always this one surge of strength that God gives to a person before they leave. It might be just to say goodbye to their family, it may be that last opportunity to hear the gospel message. And I said, you know, I feel like today he, your husband may have gotten that last surge of strength. And I went to Charles, who was jaundiced in his face, lost a lot of weight, emaciated. And I got next to his ear and I said, Charles, this is Pastor. Did you trust Jesus as your Savior? Do you know you're going to heaven? And I kid you not, a smile went from this side of the face all the way to his ear. 
Half his face smiled. Yes. She said, Pastor, he just smiled. I know my husband. He understood everything you said. I know he got saved today. Amen. We had a word of prayer around him. And I said this, Lord, thank you for your help. Thank you for saving this man. A month ago, actually three months or two months ago, we had a family. One of my men that I've been discipling and working with, I saved up a Catholic background, man in his mid-50s, good guy, pray with him every Monday. Went to his auto mechanic and says, Johnny, why don't you come to church? And Johnny and his wife, Vadna, and his, their son, Danny, came to church that morning. They came to our 8.30 service. You have 8.15, we have 8.30 service. I don't remember what I preached on that morning, but I give the gospel and all three said, we want to get saved. Amen. Christmas Sunday, they came on the Christmas service and then they had to abruptly leave. And so I asked, I, asked, uh, I asked my friend Michael, I said, Michael, did I see something to offend them? I mean, we had a full house of people there, what happened? He said, no, pastor. They said, you remember their father, uh, Johnny's father? Said, yeah, Johnny's father had a stroke and they airlifted him from Tracy to Stanford Hospital by helicopter during the service. They had to run out to go to Stanford to see him. I said, oh my. I said, we need to get an appointment to see him. And I forget the date, it was January, I think it was January 9th. January 9th, Sunday after service, Michael and I went to the skilled nursing facility where this father's at. His name is Floral. Man cannot speak. But by the grace of God, we started to witness to him. I put my arm around my friend Michael. Michael, we need the help of God. Because this man is not, he's, he's a little bit resistant to us. And this is the most amazing thing. His adult daughter came in who is not a believer. She's actually in a cult of all things. <clears throat> she came in and translated for me in Tagalog. She repeated, because I had Michael verify that she was saying what I wanted her to say, because he listened to his daughter. And as I spoke in English and witnessed to her, and she translated into Tagalog, that man, through the squeezing of my hand and Michael's hand, trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Amen. Listen, hey, I got one more story I'm going to tell you this. Our church, we actually got the property read at 2960 Merced Street when we're only two and a half years old. That's unheard of. I have friends, pastor friends, who have churches 15, 20 years. They're just getting their first properties now. We started growing. I worked on a master site plan. I thought we better get ahead of the game on this, get ahead of the curve and work on this. We spent $70,000, $80,000 on an architectural plan. The architect was the same architect that Lancaster Baptist Church used for your, your properties. A copy of me, we went to the city planning department. We sat with the planners. They were very cordial in greeting us. But you know, I, I, Dr. R, there's something unusual about that meeting because they said, this is, our city, this is our city attorney. And I said, why is the city attorney in this meeting? And at this unease in me, I said, why is the attorney in this meeting? Went through our presentation, it was for a three-phase development. And the lead planner said, Pastor Fong, this is a very elaborate plan. When he used the adjective elaborate, I said, I thought, I don't think this is going the right direction. He said, no, we're not gonna let you build. Well, the architect and I and another man that came with us, we tried different variations to try to get them to agree to. They said, no, well, I got a little frustrated, to be honest with you. Didn't get in the flesh, but I got frustrated. I stood up. I said, folks, I said, I think this meeting's over. I said, you're not going to move. I said, I don't agree with you. I'm not going to fight you. But I do know this. We will talk again. They looked at me like, what is this guy talking about? They called me up a week later. They said, we thought about your, your problem. I said, great. What are you gonna do for me? We're gonna let you build a 10 by 12. I said, a 10 by 12 what? They said, 10 feet by 12. I said, that's an outhouse. I don't need an outhouse. I need a church building yet, you know? <laughs> I said, thank you very much, but I need something a little bit larger than that. I didn't tell the church about this. I tell the deacons about it. That was on a Thursday. They told me they weren't gonna let us build. Hey, six months to the day on a Thursday, the same planner called me up, said, Pastor, I thought he was going to talk about another 10 by 12, right? You know, he says, hey, we've met, we've talked. We're going to let Heritage Baptist Church build two phases, not three. I said, we'll take it. And I thought, I'm not worried about the third phase. By the time we get the third phase, they'll all be dead or they'll all be voted out. Amen, you know? 
You got to have a little wisdom about that. Amen. Amen. Have obtained help of God. I'm done. You need God's help. Amen. Hey, you college students, you need God's help to pay your bill. To stay current on your tuition. You college students are kind of wavering about where you need to be. If God's called you to be in the ministry, be in the ministry. You've got the help of God. You say, you don't understand, Pastor, when they, when they cut the string and when I, get, when I get my diploma, it's going to be scary. Yeah, it may be scary, but you've got the help of God. You need the help of God to pay your mortgage. You need the help of God to keep your commitment for Kid City. You need the help of God to help your pastor and help the staff here to have the best Easter Sunday in the history of Lancaster Baptist Church. You need the help of God. Amen. You need the help of God to get to the mission field. You need the help of God to stay in the mission field. You need the help of God to build your growth group and your connection group. You need the help of God to stay faithful in your seat. You need the help of God to be a good disciple. It doesn't matter what you say, Pastor, you understand. I'm getting old and things are getting hard. Listen, you need the help of God if you've got arthritis. And you need the help of God if you've got rheumatoidism. And you need the help of God if you've got lupus. And you need the help of God when you when you got cancer. And by the way, I want to tell you this. You do have the help of God. Having obtained help of God, I continue this day. It doesn't matter what your circumstance, what your problem. You can trust God. You have his help. And you can continue to this day. Amen. You can keep going. You've got God's help to run the race. You've got God's help to face the devil every day. You've got God's help to face your difficult employer and your situation. You've got, you've got God's help. Having obtained help of God, I continue to this day. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Don't say it's somebody else's problem. You've got the help of God. If you've got the help of God, don't you feel like tonight? Don't you feel like tonight you need to come down to the altar and say, God, I need your help. Amen. I need your help. I need your help to get those unsaved people saved. I need your help, Lord, to be faithful to God. I need your help to make that commitment to the offer. Whatever it is tonight, you come down that aisle and you let one of the pastors know. And you let somebody know here tonight, I need help. By the way, you need the help of God for your marriage. Right. You need the help of God to raise your children. And by the way, you do have the help of God. Have you obtained help of God? I continue to this day. Would you stand with me, please?